Have you ever dreamed of traveling through time? Of going back in time and meeting our earliest ancestors? To find out if they were like us or different from who we are today? Well, it's now possible to find out. Every day, prehistorians, archaeologists, and linguists find traces of human thought and material evidence of their passage on Earth. Based on that observation, they try to understand how and why our species created the first works of art, and consequently, how humans managed to dominate the planet. When did we start talking, painting, playing music, or traveling? When did we build the first imaginary worlds? When did we need to believe in something? How did we express it? In short, when, where, and how did the essence of men come to existence? In order to understand, we must go back to our early origins, even before the era of Homo sapiens. The first Homo sapiens appeared in Africa about 240,000 years ago. In order to visualize the time frame, Suppose 240,000 years represent 24 hours, that is two rounds of the clock dial. At this scale, each hour represents 10,000 years of our human history. Presuming that today is 12 noon, the art of writing was invented 7,500 years ago, that is 11.15 p.m. on this clock. And as it's always been said that a people without a written language is a people without history, that amounts to saying that there was nothing important to report in the first 23 hours of the human adventure. So much so that this period of history was somehow disregarded by historians and absent from text-based analyses. Yet science now reveals something new. The essence of the modern man existed even before he appeared. These discoveries are staggering. Suppose language appeared earlier than previously believed, probably over one million years before the appearance of Homo sapiens. Under this approach, we can no longer talk in hours, but rather in terms of days or even weeks. This scenario is all the more astonishing since another species at the time called Homo erectus has decided to take on the world from Africa. Our ancestor Homo erectus will pronounce the first words of humankind. It's a revolution. But words fly away and in order to grasp the echo of a language coming from the earliest age we must take a new approach. We must go back to our roots to find the gestures and the ways of thinking of our ancestors to understand how flint napping led the ancestor of Homo sapiens to tell story. When I started flint napping as a teenager, what got all my attention is that it was a difficult technique. The actual difficulty is to organize the successive hits through pressure flaking in order to produce the desired result. This object is a biface, the equivalent of a Swiss Army knife for prehistoric men, designed to drill, cut and slice. But it's not only a multi-tool. If you hold it in your hand, you can feel an emotion. The biface is an example of a very early stage of civilization. 
It's the product of a new intelligence combining language with action. And it reveals the complexity of our great ancestor's brain. You can clearly see that you cannot randomly remove flakes without thinking about it. You must develop a strategy to combine the hits. It's now possible on an archaeological piece to reconstitute the order of the hits. Here we've got hits number one, two, three, and four. The arrangement of the hits is similar to a chess strategy because you need to calculate your moves before you play. So you need to design a strategy and break it down to get it done. Behind these seemingly abrupt hits, there's a thoughtful action, and each move is anticipated with great accuracy. By analyzing each step in the making of a biface, scientists have identified sophisticated mental abilities. Making a biface is exactly like building a sentence. When you want to present an idea with words, you start your presentation and then you embed an idea into the sentence. It's what we call a recursion. And you keep going. The making of a biface is based on that principle. Cognitive sciences together with cerebral imaging support this fact. When I'm designing or building a tool or watching a fellow making a tool, the same regions of the brain called the parietal lobe are at work. A sophisticated software is already in place. In a prehistoric context, Descartes' phrase, I think, therefore I am, could be translated this way, I sculpt, therefore I talk. It has a symmetrical shape, it's well thought, it's a beautiful model. This model corresponds to a concept, and I wouldn't be surprised if we found out that bifaces had names. In any event, our ancestors possessed a capacity to conceptualize. Fanga. Linguistics, cognitive sciences, and comparative anatomy give evidence that support this theory. Paleoanthropologists have identified regions of the brain related to sophisticated language. In order to date language, we just need to date the emergence of the biface. Proto-bifaces emerged more than one and a half million years ago in Eastern Africa, and 7,000 years ago on the site of Vicinia, for example, excavated by a colleague called Hélène Roche. We've collected several hundreds of bifaces of similar shape and very well done. We have evidence that signs of humankind existed before the appearance of Homo sapiens. Consequently, Homo erectus, the ancestor to our species, is also our cultural ancestor. They have a modern technical intelligence. I'm not saying that they were able to philosophize. I don't know, and we'll probably never know. However, a major step has been taken. That major step for Jacques Pellegrin is that Homo erectus hasn't waited for Homo sapiens to establish a symbolic relationship with reality, which was unprecedented in the animal kingdom. We've inherited from Homo erectus a technical ingenuity, but also the power to organize and represent our world and it became our favorite activity to exercise that power. After remaining silent for a long time, our world then became quite talkative. We now live on a planet of talkers and chatterboxes eager to communicate their words to their fellows. We thank this good old biface for helping us to reach the early stage of the human language. For further investigation, we need to question other elements to answer this enigma. Is the ability to speak the result of a learning process? Or are we programmed to do so? To clarify these age-old issues, scientists are now turning to children. When we think about the acquisition of language, we have the impression that it's easy because every day we see babies who spontaneously learn to talk between zero and three years old. 
But that impression is wrong. When we try to understand how children learn the different sounds of language, vocabulary and grammar, we realize that each issue is extraordinarily complicated. Anne-Christophe runs a cognitive science laboratory at the hospital of Port-Royal. Each day she invites parents and children to take part in scientific experiments. In their early months, infants already seem to have amazing language skills. Benjamin is two years old. He already knows a few words, but he cannot build a grammatically correct sentence. Yet he's going to show us that he can identify syntax errors when an adult speaks. Children sit on their mom's laps and watch a film. In this film, they listen to correct sentences such as, I told him it will be sunny tomorrow, and other incorrect sentences such as, I gave him it will be sunny tomorrow. We can see the differences in brain activity between these two sentences. The goal of this experiment is to identify what two-year-old children already know. They know the meaning of the verb to give, and they know that this word cannot fit in a sentence like, I gave him it will be sunny tomorrow. He shouts at him that he's happy to be saved. Alice gives him that she's going out. The results indicate that Benjamin's brain activity is very different when he hears a weird sentence. These results show us that at the age of two, children are already able to analyze whether a sentence is correct or not, even if they listen to complicated sentences that they will only be able to pronounce a year later. Not only that, Nathan is younger than Benjamin, and yet, when we teach him new words, he surprises us. This is a Tony. Do you know what a Tony is? Where is the Tony? We find that Nathan, at 18 months, already makes a distinction between nouns and verbs. It shows that children use specific acquisition mechanisms to understand language even before they start to speak correctly. These experiments show that language is not only the result of a learning process. Today we may ask whether our species is biologically predisposed to speak. We are now certain that we are born with an innate capacity for language. We know that something acquired at birth allows children to learn how to speak, yet we don't know what it is. When we investigate the issue of innate aptitudes, we search for answers from a genetic perspective. A recent discovery has been the subject of much debate, the FOXP2 gene, playing a key role in neural development. Although that gene is common to all mammals, we are the only species who carry two or three amino acids. These two or three amino acids would make the difference between intelligent These two or three amino acids would make the difference between intelligent chimpanzees who are unable to talk and us. The quest for language genes might bother some philosophers, but we are only poor scientists. We need material evidence in science, but we never said that it was reduced merely to that element. We believe this mechanism for the acquisition of language is very ancient, just as ancient as language itself. Children who learned how to speak 200,000 years ago, when Homo sapiens appeared, used the same mechanisms children still use today. En sortant de l'école, nous avons rencontré un grand chemin de fer qui nous a emmenés tout autour de la terre dans un wagon doré. 
Even though this biological mechanism for learning plays an important role, this single element alone cannot account for the complexity of language which we've produced over thousands of years. A poetic language at times, but not always so. Among primates, language is a sort of monstrosity. It's part of our biological features to spend hours each day to speak trivia. It's sunny. Have you seen the latest game? Have you watched the latest movie? See, we don't talk about world news. We don't share any essential information. Each day for six hours, we're involved in language interactions. There's a striking contradiction between the futility of our conversations and the great amount of energy involved. A simple reasoning could encourage us to talk less and make a better use of our time. Let's make a better use of our mental abilities and we'll benefit from it. That's not the case. If we're a universally talkative species today, it necessarily means that our earlier ancestors were talkative too. But in that case, how would you explain the vital importance of chit-chat for prehistoric men? Following an extensive investigation on this issue, Jean-Louis de Salle offers a bold approach. According to him, the development of human language would be the consequence of an unprecedented innovation in the history of humankind, the emergence of weapons. Let's try to imagine what happened to a species of primates who were our actual ancestors when a weapon such as a pointed stick or stone was used for murder. Our species is a violent kind. It's not the only one. If you consider other species of primates, there's a great deal of violence as well. In our sister species, the chimpanzee, murders are perpetrated as well. Male chimpanzees patrol their territory to hunt down any isolated male from a neighboring community who might be sitting on their land. If that's the case, they kill him. They always kill the male with bare hands or with their teeth. This kind of murder bears a risk because even with five chimpanzees against one, they end up severely wounded. So any murder perpetrated by chimpanzees is a direct murder at close range which bears a risk, whereas in our species, murder is much easier to carry out. If our ancestors found a way to dominate nature with the use of weapons, de Salle adds that these weapons could also backfire in a situation of revenge or dispute. We have many archaeological evidence of this violent behavior. Human beings universally assault each other with weapons. They wait for the right opportunity. For example, when the victim is asleep or turns his back, it's so easy. In today's society, it's more difficult with the police force and the justice system around, but in the life of a hunter-gatherer, if you resent somebody, you may wait for him to be asleep and then you can kill him. This has completely transformed our political system. We find again the founding myth of murder, common to so many cultures. In fact, the invention of weapons created terrifying power and had fatal consequences on the community. Even the strongest men could be killed. Now anybody could be under attack, anywhere and at any time. It then became necessary to invent new safeguards. Before the invention of weapons, you had to be physically strong to resist the attack of others against you. After the invention of weapons, you must be informed to diminish the risk of being killed by surprise.
To counteract such risk, you can choose your friends to anticipate that danger and make your friends your allies instead of your potential enemies. Language is the long-term consequence of that situation where our ancestors started to kill each other by surprise. This obsession for exchanging, talking, and confiding in others would be an ancestral heritage. Because we need reliable friends, we've been encouraged to talk, to alert others, to tell stories about the environment in which we live. This vital need most likely accelerated the development of language. In a way, our day-to-day -day conversations serve as a sort of life insurance. As we share our emotions, we make public our emotional profile. We become predictable for our friends. In a way, we're telling them, I'm not a danger for you. We talk so much because language has saved the lives of our ancestors. It's not the information itself that matters, but rather the social interactions which protect us in a context of insecurity. For a long time, the friends you chose played a key role. The selection of friends was made on the basis of language. Prehistoric men were eager to surround themselves with people who could talk, who could name things and tell stories. Language is first of all a matter of talkers rather than listeners. It's a matter of speakers. No. We fight to have a word, we don't fight to listen. On the market of friendships, people prefer to be with friends who are informed. The person who knows nothing loses points. When someone is boring, we stop meeting that person. We choose our friends on the basis of what they can teach us that we don't know. We are craving for news because we can then share it, even if that news is trivial. From the cradle to the grave, the sacred task of a human being is to surround himself with friends who are reliable and capable of protecting him. The art of conversation was an important activity for our ancestors. It creates future alliances which ensure the group's survival. Within a few years, science has enormously progressed on the origins and the development of language, and much remains to be discovered. After the invention of weapons, another event draws the attention of researchers. Fire casts new light on the kingdom of darkness. It serves as a protection. It creates magic with moving shadows. Fire has changed everything. Fire is a key element. Imagine that fire suddenly keeps you warm, makes you independent from daylight, allows you to shed light on the dark around you, helps you to defend yourself against predators and make it possible to cook your food. It's a revolution. I believe that it was an important factor which helped for the development of language. Around the fireplace you can tell about your day, you can impress others with your stories and use imagination for anything you've seen that day, an animal, a wonderful bison and what not. I believe these nights were rich with stories and I'm convinced we've inherited from that early language. The ability to control fire also preceded the appearance of our species. The most ancient settlements date more than 500,000 years ago. That means the invention of fire is even older than that, like the biface, or the early stage of language. Such revolutions transform every aspect of society. Watch how many people love to sit around a fireplace.
It's part of our ancient human memory because it's a very old ritual. We sit around the fireplace with some friends and relatives and we start chit chatting. The conversation starts. This is the very essence of men. A great ethologist called Mr. von Eskel said, animals live in this world, men build new worlds. And from that time on, the essence of Homo is to build symbolic worlds and develop symbolic dimensions based on reality. In the first settlements, organized around the principle of exchange, the advent of articulated language will allow the Homo kind to express emotions, dreams, desires and fears, and through that expression, paving the way to art. Cave art is generally considered as a relatively easy field compared to other forms of art. I feel that the more I work, the more I produce, the more I realize how much remains to be learned. Alain Fenet is a visual artist. A long time ago, he became interested in cave painting, and more particularly in what Malraux and others called the Sistine Chapel of prehistory, the Lascaux Caves. They didn't paint to make an impression. They painted to tell something deep and true. And you can tell from their features. On top of it, they were very skilled painters. You can feel an emotion every time you see a cave even when it's a reconstitution of the Chauvet or Lascaux caves, it remains extraordinary. You get the impression they've left just minutes ago, leaving all their gear behind and that they might just be on their way back. This is the only art that gives me that kind of emotion. Maybe because it has a sacred dimension, you see it differently. You feel a particular emotion. When he went into the depths of the caves, Homo sapiens walked into an extraordinary place, a sanctuary devoted to something very particular with stalactites and stalagmites, a place that doesn't exist outside, a place with a vast supply of water which was a vital element at the time. It was a real place full of magic and symbolically powerful. It probably felt like walking through a stargate. We're here in the cave of El Castillo, in the Spanish Basque country. Francesco De Rico, researcher at the CNRS, is familiar with the darkness of the caves. He regularly trudges up and down these caves to immerse himself in that atmosphere where symbolical worlds were created by our ancestors. Prehistoric men had a different approach than us when they walked into a cave. The colors were different because they used torches, which created movements of shadows. The cave is a world filled with moving shadows which are perceived as living beings by those who walk in. On that day, he descends 400 meters into that cave to shed light on one of the greatest mysteries of our history, these marks on the walls. They are one of the oldest symbolic representations known today in Europe. We get the feeling that these dots were made by spitting the pigment on the walls. That left small lumps, and on some of these spits, some rubbed the pigment in with their finger, and sometimes left their fingerprints.
Sometimes it's difficult to date these pigments, but a layer of calcite on some of these paintings allow us to date them. We can say that some of these red dots were made 41,000 years ago. So the date for this dot is at least 35,000 years old? Okay. The new datings of the oldest representations are now changing our perspective on the first symbolic rituals in Europe. I would say this is a major step in the evolution of our symbolic culture, which emerges before El Castillo, probably in Africa or in Europe, with rituals which have left few archaeological remains. And here we've got an example of that milestone. More than age itself, it's the dilemma we face that is so impressive. How can we interpret such acts? Should this abstract figuration be considered as art? We see them as mere red marks, but sometimes it bears a fundamental meaning. Behind these red marks, there's a story full of magic and traditions, which we have lost, but which are reflected by these wall paints. The cave itself becomes an element of symbolic culture. The cave is a container full of dreams and symbols, but it's also a harsh and challenging environment, which is therefore ideal for initiation ceremonies, for example. Inside the group, some individuals initiate others and play a certain role to preserve the cohesion of the group. These rituals allow the group to communicate with the afterlife or the invisible world. We can suppose that these dots or features told a story for those who would come next. I can imagine a group of individuals who came here to hold ritual practices. The group might have left a message for the next group. It might be a way to communicate. Some prehistorians assume that some caves were considered as social gathering places. We know that these communities of hunter-gatherers had cycles of nomad migrations, and when the time was right, these groups would meet. These behavior patterns were based on sacred practices. The decorated cave was not meant for daily life. It was rather considered as a sanctuary. So who had the right to go into these caves? What stories and myths were forged here? It's difficult to find simple answers to these questions. We can only say that we are facing traces of ancient paintings with a symbolic dimension and an intention to communicate. With who? that remains a mystery. This is an atmosphere of great communion where men share their hearts and souls. Men were driven by a powerful energy that could make them go into a trance, for example. I don't know what were the purposes of these rituals, but it must have been a very powerful experience. I wish I could have attended these gatherings. We know that cave sounds were part of the rituals. When we refer to prehistoric art, I always hear my colleagues talk only about paintings and engravings. We fail to take into account the sound dimension of the caves. 
When Father Broyle and Father Glory visited some of these caves in the 19th century, they noticed that these paintings were surrounded by sound patterns created by water drops forming stalactites and stalagmites. The impacts of these drops have been analyzed, and a relationship has been established between these sounds and cave paintings. This is the first actual theater born in prehistoric times. It's beautiful. And I'm convinced that sounds inspired prehistoric men and encouraged them to settle there, where they had enough space to perform rituals and to produce paintings on these walls. All forms of art were actually invented by these men. We know they had flutes and drums. They actually played music, sang, and danced. It's obvious that all of these art forms, song, dance, poetry, and narration, were combined to perform rituals. These behavior patterns are now part of our ancestral heritage. When you watch a child intuitively starting to make musical sounds, that's the expression of ancestral behaviors which are part of our essence as human beings. It's difficult to grasp the prehistoric origin of music and dance because these art forms have left little evidence. Yet, we can feel the impact these sounds have on us. Consequently, we can imagine the impact it had on cavemen. Here we have the typical example of a discovery made by the prehistory department of the Musée de l'Homme. These objects have been studied by many researchers. All prehistorians are familiar with these objects that were considered for a long time as Saharan pestles. These objects, shaped like a pestle to grind the grain, were found in the sands of the Sahara in Morocco, Niger, Algeria, or Mauritania. The oldest pieces are about 10,000 years old. We believe they were held horizontally to grind cereals between stones. Several researchers have examined the Saharan pestles and they thought they had exhausted all the possibilities. But they failed to take into account another dimension. They never thought of diverting the object of its function as a tool. In my view, this is not a Saharan pestle. I started knocking on the instrument, and I found some interesting sounds. You can hear harmonics, it's not just noise. This sounds like noise. This sounds like harmonics is a harmonious sound which is pleasing to the ear. I said, hot damn, we've got musical instruments. Music has come out of the caves. These instruments look like stalagmites or stalactites because they have approximately the same shape. If you hold them vertically and fix them to the ceiling, you have the equivalent of stalactites or stalagmites. The greatest revolution is that these instruments are the first proto-MP3s of humankind. You can carry these harmonics around with you and travel thousands of kilometers. Thanks to the geology, we know that this piece has traveled over a thousand kilometers through the desert.
We named it Stradivarius because it produces the most beautiful sounds and the best vibrations. If you're open to that view, the magic of this musical art form is that the sound you can hear now is exactly the same sound passed down to us by prehistoric men. Here's the reproduction of a flute found on an archaeological site in Austria. It's over 18,000 years old. Wolf Hein is not famous for playing the prehistoric flute, but he's a master in the art of designing instruments with the same tools used by our ancestors. This piece represents hard work. For a mammoth of this size, you must count from 30 to 40 hours of work. After a while, it causes blisters. It's really exhausting. With these little wonders, you get a first glance at the artistic creativity of prehistoric craftsmen. We need culture to understand each other. Without culture, we would end up fighting each other. Culture, religion and music cannot be separated. If you add to this a craftsmanship and expertise, then you're ready to survive the Ice Age. The last Ice Age started 100,000 years ago. On the European continent, 40,000 years ago, temperatures suddenly dropped down to minus 25 degrees Celsius at wintertime and rarely rose above 10 degrees Celsius at summertime. Our ancestors had to adjust to these harsh conditions. In that context, the first large pieces of sculpture emerge in southwest Germany. In 2009, I sculpted the Lion Man, a statue found in the Lone Valley. The sculpture is about 30,000 years old. It was sculpted in one piece, carved out of a mammoth tusk. This unique artifact was found in 1939. It's 30 centimeters in height, and it's the largest statue ever made at the time. Carved out of ivory, it shows a human body with a lion head. It's a mysterious, anthropomorphic piece, full of emotion. Wildlife on the European continent was much different than what it is today. You might run into a mammoth, or come face to face with the largest known prehistoric lion, the cave lion, a great predator that lived on a vast territory from Siberia to southern Europe during the entire Ice Age. This animal must have fascinated our ancestors, given the time and energy you need to carve such a piece. Was it a commissioned work? How much time did it take to carve it? A day, a week, a month? Can you carve such an object on your spare time when you're back from hunting? Does it take much more time? Only practice can tell. 
Es war unglaublich viel Arbeit. Ich habe wirklich Monate lang It feels like an endless task. I spent entire months in my garden scraping and carving. I worked on small details like the ears, the eyes. To achieve this, you must count 400 hours of work to sculpt it with ancient tools. 400 hours. It represents six weeks of continuous work at the rate of eight hours a day. After all this hard work, Wolf Hein could testify what it cost to achieve such an artifact. It reflects the symbolic importance that the symbolic importance of this piece for the artist. It's far from the sordid image of these prehistoric women and men fearing starvation. I believe the lion-headed figurine was made out of one piece. Its author must have spent an entire winter working on it. In the collective imagination, people from the Stone Age wear rough animal skins and move around like primitive savages. But when you want to create such a refined object and carve it out of one ivory tusk, you must be able to visualize the object in three dimensions. The intention is not to reproduce animals that exist in nature. This goes beyond figurative art. The combination of a human body with a lion head represents the first imaginary being in the history of art. It's the result of a concept which emerged more than 40,000 years ago. But what did it represent exactly? A totem? A mythical being? A legend? We'll probably never know. But what we already know is that despite the rugged conditions of prehistoric times, great artists were already at work. The sewing needle was invented about 15,000 years ago. I carved it out of this bone by scraping the contours. If you didn't wear tight-fitting clothes, you couldn't go out hunting during the Ice Age. It would be impossible. When it's minus 30 degrees Celsius, you can't just throw an animal skin over your shoulders, otherwise you freeze to death. That's why the sewing needle is one of the most important inventions of humankind. It's all about using your brains. If you need something specific to survive, you must invent the proper tools. To achieve this, I need expertise and craftsmanship. That's when you realize that these men were not just mere growling beasts. It doesn't add up. These people had brains. In Wolf Hines' workshop, you can find tools, weapons, and carved stones. The artifacts aren't massive pieces, but Wolf Hine is attached to these delicate wonders. With his wonderful artifacts, he draws an enlightened portrait of our ancestors and offers it to our glints, filled with wonder. This one was discovered recently. It's called the Venus of Holyfells. It's a 40,000-year-old figurine sculpted out of mammoth ivory. It has a perforated protrusion, which may have allowed its owner to wear it around the neck as an amulet. I imagine its owner used a leather ribbon to hold the figurine on the chest. As you can see on the original piece, both sides are polished. It certainly means that the figurine was placed between a woman's breasts. The Venus of Holy Fells is the oldest female figurine known to this day. Its owner wore it around the neck as an amulet. This is the Venus of Brasson Puy, also known as the Lady with the Hood. This woman probably existed. The features are so accurate and refined that we believe it's the portrait of a real woman at the time. We believe she actually posed for this work.
The Venus of Gonnersdorf is about 16,000 years old. You can recognize a woman's behind and breasts, but the depictions are much stylized. It's a radically abstract representation. When you know this Venus was carved 160 centuries ago, it becomes difficult to state with certainty that some recent art forms were invented only a century ago. We clearly see a change in the different artistic approaches. It's not about replacing the ugly with the beautiful, but rather replacing roughness with refinement. There are different periods corresponding to different artistic approaches. 10,000 years elapsed between each period, but we never stopped producing art. It proves that art played a fundamental role. We always think that many inventions, many art forms like painting and music were invented during the Renaissance or by Greeks or Egyptians. But actually it's already been laid out. It's already in place. These artifacts are sometimes over 40,000 years old. These are real works of art like Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, but on a smaller scale and made out of ivory. So let's pay a tribute to these men and women. We are eternally grateful to them, and the rest of their history always remains to be written. <laughs>